Hello, everyone. So today's throwback is um, it's called Going Back to the Beginning, Learning How to Set Boundaries. And I am going to do this episode in two parts because number one, it's a lot to go through. And number two, I want to make sure that I have and you have the space to process what I'm about to share with you. Here's the thing. Please take care of yourself. I will be talking about um, sexual abuse. I will be talking about family dynamics. I'm going to be talking about a lot of things that can be activating for you. And I just want you to take care of you. If it gets too heavy, if it gets too much, take care of you. Cut this off and come back to it if you want to or don't come back to it. It's perfectly fine, but get what you need. That is a warning for you. All right, let's get into it. So this was, it says the last time I looked at this was December, 2015, but I feel like it would have had to be, I guess it was December, 2015. We are gonna go with it y'all. December 28th, 2015. And at this time in my life, I was doing a lot of work of going back to facing the past. Like it had become clear to me that there were some things in my past that I thought I was, I had, I was over. I used to tell, I used to go to counseling. I used to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had some like sexual abuse stuff, but I'm over it now. I just want to talk to you about what's going on now. And I'm sure that counselor, that therapist, they were like, oh, she's so cute. She doesn't think this has anything to do with her problems today. And <laughs> I was being cute. But anyway, I have been in counseling since high school, since they told me it was free. But for whatever reason, this time around in counseling was a little bit, Different. Like I was more, I don't know, serious about it or committed to it because I was really committed to, I was like, I just want to be a different person. I want to be healed. I'm tired of these things bothering me was my, my energy around it. And of course, y'all, y'all know this was, this was going back to a relationship problem. <laughs> I was having some issues in my relationships and a lot of times in relationships, we tend to blame the other person. Like it's their fault as to why we're experiencing. Like if you would only do this, things could be good. Like it could all be so simple. If you just do what I told you to do. And what that would ultimately lead me to is like, how did I choose this person to be in a relationship with? How do I keep choosing the same person in relationships? I feel like I've had a lot of relationships in my life. You know, I don't feel like I'm that old, but when I look back, you know, Sex in the City was not just a show for me, okay? <laughs> And there were some things that I started to realize, some commonalities. And I used to be like, well, clearly I'm the common denominator. So something must be wrong with me. So I went to therapy to be like, girl, what's wrong with me? Because I want this to work. And for this particular relationship I was in in 2015, I desperately, desperately wanted it to work. So my partner at the time, we're going to call him AT. Um, he just, there was a lot of he had a lot of anger and frustration and I thought it was a lot of anger and frustration around the pettiest things. Like I was like, you making that up. That's not even a real thing. And it was like the emotion from both of us did not match the situation we were in. For example, we would get into an argument because one of us was being short with the other person and the other person took it personal. So instead of being like, okay, well, clearly they're having a bad day. I'm gonna let them be. I'm gonna go about my business. I'm not gonna let it ruin my day. Instead of doing that, it took it as a personal attack. Like, what's wrong with you? You don't need to be angry. I'm having a good day. If you angry, then there's something wrong. We got to fix it. And so I went to counseling to be like, girl, what is happening here? Can you help me figure it out? What do I need to do? How do I need to change things? Should I leave this relationship? Because it don't really feel like it's the best, but I really love them. I really want to be with them. And so I, I went to go work on that. I wanted to know, I really wanted to save the relationship. And she had to be like, hey, girl, hey, hey, girl, hey, this is not a quick fix overnight. This is not just a matter of improving communication dynamics. Like, yes, that's going to help, but that's not going to really get to the core of the problem. And she was like, do you realize there are some commonalities between this relationship and the one that you have with your parents? I was like, say what now? What my mama got to do with this? Because I didn't even really think to think of my daddy, but that's a whole nother story that we're going to talk about later, y'all. I was like, what's she got to do with it? She's like, here, let me go give you some things to read because you like to go do some research. I started doing my research and I was like, attachment styles. What are we talking about? I started finding things on Pinterest and the internet around your parents being your first relationship examples and that how that relationship went will tell you all you need to know about the relationships you have right now. But your relationship with your primary caregivers, because if it's not your parents, your primary caregivers teaches you 
how to move forward. It's like what you will always go back to as an example of what it means to be in a relationship. Like let that sink in your spirit. How you were in relation to your parents is always what you go back to to measure how well you're doing now, even as a whole grown up in terms of your relationship. So I had to be like, huh, let me go back and think about this. You mean to tell me that these people who I was like, I'm... I'm evolved because I used to have this. I'm like, I'm evolved. I am better than my parents. Oh, life in your early 20s, but go with me. Like, I, he's like, I'm so evolved. I'm better than them. But, but the stuff on the internet is telling me, actually, no, you're not. You're the same. You're going through the same thing. And now that I'm into astrology and a student of astrology, I'm like, oh, girl, <laughs> that was cute. Because, um, um, spoiler alert, y'all, astrology will clearly tell you how. The very thing your parents went through is in your chart, meaning you're going to go through them too. This is where generational curses and patterns come in, but this is not what this episode is about. Right? This was saying that the relationships that I had with my mother and my father, it informs on how I see myself, why I make the decisions that I do, and how I ended up in this relationship with this person that we keep yelling at each other for having a bad day. I was forced to acknowledge that not only do I have a lot of pain and frustration towards my family, but a lot of it was directed towards my mama. Why? Because she was the parent that I spent the most time with. She was the parent who I had the most, I built my example of what it meant to be in a relationship off of because I didn't spend that much time with my father. But again, like I said, we're going to get to him later, right? So I had a lot of pent up frustration against her. And, and what I remember in particular is I had a lot of frustration about her not acknowledging my childhood sexual abuse. Her story is that she does not remember it happening. She does not remember me telling her. She doesn't remember anything. And had she known, had she known she would have done something is what she said. Not only over at this point, this is remember, this is 2015, up to this point, in casual conversation, it was nothing for her to tell me about my molesters, my abusers. It was nothing to drop a like, oh, I saw them or I want to go visit them because they're family members. So I experienced sexual abuse from the ages of like three to 10, y'all. And at some point I just stopped telling people because I didn't feel like anyone believed me or they did anything about it. And then because it kept happening, and I was like, oh, well, I guess this is what we're supposed to do. Because at three, how are you supposed to rationalize, right? But I realized that in 2015, I realized that for her, she just kept bringing them up like it's natural. Like she, st she still, even all these years later, didn't even care. I'd be like, you know, maybe this bothers her. So maybe a few days before I wrote this post, she had called me. She said, I was just calling you to say hi. And she told me that, one of the family members that had abused me, she was going to go see him. He had just gotten out of jail and he wanted to be around his family, apparently, I guess. And when she said it, because she said it so casually, my brain was like, it couldn't understand what was happening. Like, I, I, I guess I can describe it as being in shock. Like, hey, what now, girl? Like, I just, my brain couldn't believe, like, why is she telling me this? Like, she just told me she was going to up, pick up some milk from the store. And I was like, how could she not see that this would be hurtful? How could she be so careless? And I just remember getting off the phone and being really confused about it. And then after a while, I, that confusion started to turn into anger and frustration. And I knew I needed to say something to her, but I was so afraid to say anything because I was not a person who would confront anyone. I would not tell anyone how I was feeling. I was just someone who would hold it all in and just be like, I just have to deal with it. But for something, something shifted for me in this day because I couldn't call. I was like, I'm going to text her because we got, we all have to start somewhere, y'all. I had to text her and I'm going to read you the text because I wrote it down because I didn't have the courage to call. I'm like, I'm going to text. I didn't think I can control my anger if I called her. So the text said, I didn't want to say this in front of the kids because she, when she called me and my nieces, my two nieces were in the car and I think they would have had to be, what's math y'all? They would have had to be like seven and three or four at that time. So I was like, I didn't want to say this in, in front of the kids, but it hurts me that you're going to, you brought him up and that you're going to see him. He molested me and you bring him up like you don't care about that. It may not mean anything to you, but it pisses me off. Just don't mention him to me. 
I know you're going to say you don't remember. I know you're going to say it didn't happen or it's in the past, but it did happen and it bothers me every day. So don't mention him or anything that you're doing with him. There's no need to reply to this message. I just wanted you to know I can't talk about it right now. So don't call me either. That was the message, y'all. And I remember reading that message over and over and over. And I was really afraid to send it, but I was like, I just got to send it because that's my truth. It was my one of my very first attempts of putting up boundaries. The boundary there was... I'm not going to tell you that you can't go see him or whatever because you're grown, but just don't mention him to me. Don't talk to me about him. And the other boundary was, please don't call me because I can't do it right now. But just like boundaries are for you, doesn't mean other people are going to listen to it and follow it. This is what happened. So I sent it to her. I took a deep breath and I was preparing for her backlash because my mother... <laughs> She's much better now, but she used to be like, oh, you went against me? You tried to stand up to me? She would like just call everybody. It would be a big deal. It can't be just a simple conversation. But the message that immediately came back was, I'm sorry, I forgot. Please forgive me. Love you. I was shocked at the response because it wasn't negative. It wasn't hateful. It wasn't what I was expecting. And so I wasn't sure how to respond. So I was like, let me just give it a minute. And then another message came back. Don't say that. I do feel bad. I'm your mother and don't ever tell me not to call you. You know how many people wish their mothers were here? Unless you really mean it, don't tell me not to call you. I'm so sorry that happened. I love you so much. I got pissed, y'all. Pissed because I was like, yep, I knew it was coming. Because let me even break down this message. Don't say that I do feel bad. That's a denying of my feelings. That's not acknowledging my emotions. I'm your mother and don't ever tell me not to call you. So there's a power dynamic. She feels that because she's my mother that she gets to tell, like, I can't ever tell her don't call me. I can't ever set a boundary. You know how many people wish their mother were here? That's a guilt trip. I don't like what you're saying. I don't like that you set this boundary with me. And let me guilt you because so many people don't even have their mothers and you have your mother. So why would you talk to me that way? Unless you really mean it. I did mean it. I said it, right? But that's her being like, are you sure? You know, if you pull this car, right? And I'm saying this not to demonize her, but to show you how the subtle ways that people will try to control your behavior, especially if they are a parent. Because there's a particular dynamic there. I mean, there's a power relationship. They're used to being the one who took care of you. And so they feel like they have more control over you. Don't tell me not to call you. And then she ends it with, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that happened. What is she referring to when she said, I'm so sorry that happened? Is she saying that the part that she forgot? Is she sorry that, that he did that to begin with? Is she sorry that she didn't acknowledge? Is she sorry that she brought him up, right? Like, what is she sorry about? Apologies. Sincere apologies come with an acknowledgement of what the person feel like they've done wrong or the impact that they had. And then it ends with, I love you so much. Before I even get to the rest of this story, this is just enough, y'all, of can you imagine then why I would grow up kind of being confused about how things are supposed to be in a relationship? It makes sense why me at that point was in a relationship with someone who I went all the way to therapy because I felt like we kept getting short with each other when we, that wasn't the real thing, y'all. But if we go back to the original relationship, right? Even in this interaction, I put down a boundary with her and this is her response. This is lifelong, right? This isn't just because of this situation. This is an indicator of how she learned how to communicate herself. This is probably, she's just doing what was modeled for her. In the same way, my grandmother was probably doing what was modeled to her. This is how we get to generational patterns here. Gen generational trauma. It's not, right, the point of this is not to demonize her. It's to talk about the behavior. It's to talk about the pattern in her communication, as well as how she has interacted with me. The reason why I'm going in such detail about this is because it's important for us to start to tease apart. Like when we no longer make a person, they're bad and they're a demon. When we no longer do that, like we have absolutes, then it forces us to like start to untangle these pieces. I genuinely know in my core that 
He does care about me. Now, love may be a different thing, but I, I have a different subject. I believe that she believes she loves me in the best way that she can. The reason why I'm, I'm hesitating is because for me, love is an action. And I believe that most of us are not really loving, that most of us may have care for a person, affinity towards a person, but to love them requires something different, my opinion. But to say here in this situation, I believe that she believed she really meant that, that she didn't want to hurt me, that she didn't want to say these things. And I also believe that she was a little bit upset about me setting a boundary. So let's keep going. So I was like, I'm pissed. How did she turn this around and make it about her? That's what she always do. That, that's, that was what my thinking was. She always does this. And this was the response that I was expecting. I wasn't expecting the first one of like, I'm sorry, I forgot, please forgive me. And to be truthful, y'all, the first message, I'm sorry, I forgot, please forgive me, love you, was supposed to fix it and dead the issue. But because I took too long to respond, then I got that second message. It's like, oh, you're not going to even take that? Okay, I'll, I'll show you. And it took me a few minutes to calm down to even respond. And so even though I was still upset, I, I did my best to be like rational and calm. But I said, I love you too. Thank you for the apology. I have to forgive you because I can't keep punishing myself. I'm the only one in pain and hurt while you go on fine with your life. I've been dealing with this for 27 years because I was 27 at the time. I said not to call right now, but that's that's making this about you. Don't try and guilt don't try and guilt trip me about that either. You may be alive, but you're not really here for me. I don't need gifts or the money more than I need my mama. To care about what I do in my life, to actually know what I'm in school for and what I plan to do next. To actually call me and check in on me when I say I have a huge test coming up that took months to get through. I don't talk about anything anymore or call because I don't think you really care. I talk to you about stuff and you just brush it off. It also frustrates me that you would take the girls around him. Let's make sure you watch them because you didn't watch out for me. Oh, I know I said I tried to be calm and rational. I wasn't clearly by this message calm and rational. After I sent this, she started calling and berating me and I just put the phone on silent. Okay, let me break down my response to her. Her response of being like trying to guilt trip me and trying to like say, don't say those things unless you really mean it, triggered me even more. So I was already activated and that response took me up to another level. Now me, 37 year old me, would go to 27 year old me and say, hey girl, hey. Um, so could we just take a moment before we respond? Like you don't have to respond right now. That's what I would say to her. You don't have to respond right now. You can like give it a moment, give it some time. Right, but 27 year old me was like, I'm not with the shits. Let's go. So I was like, let me start off too. I love you too, girl. Thank you for the apology. Let me try to acknowledge you. Right. And then this is where <laughs> none of what I said was wrong. It's just like, was it the time? Is what I'm saying. I have to forgive you because I can't keep punishing myself, which is true. Right. We forgive not for the other people, but it's for us. We set boundaries not for other people, but for us. It's about us. Right. So me saying, I got to forgive you because I keep punishing myself for something I didn't even do. Right. I'm the only one because that's what happens. We end up being the only people in pain and still hurting and stewing about the thing, thinking that if we hold on to the pain, that that's going to hurt the other person. If you ever heard the quote of, you know, like not forgiving someone is drinking rat poison and hoping they die. That's what happens. You get so consumed with the pain and the hurt because you think if you let it go, then it lets the other person off the hook. Like I thought if I hold, held on to the pain and the hurt that if I let it go, it would let my parents off the hook for them not being there. But I was the only one 27 years still holding on to it because obviously she forgot, right? <laughs> um, I told her what I was trying to say. It's like, I'm telling you not to call right now because to call and talk to you, it would be you making it about you when I just told you what I needed to be okay. I'm trying to get trip me about me putting down the boundary of you, of telling you not to call me. Right. But I could have refrained that to say, you can do what you want to do. I'm not answering. Right. Because to make it not controlling would be, you know, you can keep calling. Just know I'm not going to pick it up. You can, you grown. You can do what you want to. I'm just not going to pick up the phone because I need a moment. Right? And I go on to say, you may be alive, but you're not really here for me. You may be alive, but you're not really here for me. What's the point of you being alive if you're not here, if you're not present with me, if you're not in a relationship with me? Right. My parents' way of showing love is to buy gifts and give money. So me saying, I don't need the gifts or the money more than I need my mama was me saying, I need you as a person. I don't need what you can do for me 
I need you, right? To go back to me, I spent and I still am working through this idea of in order to be in relationship with people, I have to give them something that me alone isn't enough to be in a relationship with them that I have to buy them things or I have to help them make money or I have to do all these things for them, even at the detriment of myself, because that's what I learned. Right? I said, I don't need gifts or money. I need her. I need her to care about what I'm doing in my life, right? Something that started off about uh, a sexual abuse, like a, a, a something that started off with a simple, here's what I'm doing with my day, right? Now we're opening up, it opened up the floodgates. It's like, call me, let me like be interested in what I have going on. Like actually know what degree I'm getting. To this day, y'all, to this day, my parents can't tell you what I'm getting my degree in. And it's something that a lot of, you know, clients joke about like, yeah, my family don't know. They just know I'm in school. But that's a big deal. It's just like, take the time out to learn. Don't say it's complicated because is it really complicated to learn the title? You don't have to know what it is, but at least get the title right is where I was at. And then be interested in who I am and what I'm going to do next. To actually call me and check in on me when I say I have a huge test coming up. Because at that time I was studying for a really big test called your um, preliminary exam. Some people call them qualifying exams. But these are these exams that essentially is testing you on the knowledge of everything that you learned in every class of your program. So every class that I had in my doctoral program, I'm going to take a test on. They can ask me any question that I should know the answer to it. She did, but I kept telling my family at the time, like, I'm really nervous. I think I'm going to fail. I don't know what's going on. And they would just brush me off. Like, yeah, you smart. You can figure it out, figure it out. And that sent the message message to me that they didn't really care. It also frustrates me how I end this message is it also frustrates me that you would take the girls, you would take my nieces around the very person that you know harmed me at the very age that you're taking them. He's a pedophile. You're taking little girls around him. It was my way to hold her accountable. Like you, you do know that, right? Now this part probably wasn't godly or holy, but here we go. And I said, just make sure that you watch them because you didn't watch out for me. Then I that was a little low. Doesn't mean it wasn't valid, but you know, maybe I would choose my words differently now. I'm not really sure, but she, she got it. She caught it. I wanted her to know you did not watch out for me. You need to watch out for them. And the moment I sent that, she kept calling. I did not pick up the phone because what would be the point? I said what I said. She said what she said. And I knew that she was not in a place to really talk to me like a rational human. I wasn't in a place to talk to her like a rational human, that we didn't even have the skills to talk to each other rationally. She left so many voicemails, y'all. And we just gonna say, to keep it cute, they were not good. They were hurtful. They were mean. And what stands out the most was that she thought I was a better person than, than that, to send a message like that, that I wasn't being woman enough to talk to her face to face. So when apologizing immediately didn't work, she went to guilting me. And when that didn't work, she went to antagonizing me, threatening me, trying to say, I thought you were woman enough. I just want to pause because that might be a lot. I know a lot might be coming up for some of you, especially if you have a very tense relationship with your own mother, because there's a special, there's a special dynamic there. The relationship that you've had with your mother will show you the relationships you now have with women. It will show you why you have the relationships that you have now with women and why you've had certain relationships throughout your life in the same ways with women. If you can go back to your mother, if you had interactions with your mother, whatever those may be from the past, it's a great opportunity or activity to do is to go back to see what is that. Mean sharing this makes sense why here I am going to therapy for a relationship with a man when that really wasn't even a thing. It showed me why I had trouble maintaining friendships with other women. Why I, I used to say all the time, you know what? I don't really do relationships with women. I'm more like men and I know I'm speaking in the binary. That's who I was back then, y'all, okay? I just need, I wasn't delivered yet, all right? But it, it makes sense why I would say like, no, I'm not really good friends with them. They, they too this, they too that. It's coming back from this, right? If our parents are our first relationships, this makes sense. That me setting a boundary led to this. And I did not talk to her 
for months after this. And I'm going to talk to you about what it looks like when I try to reach out to support from other family members. That's going to be on the next episode, y'all. It did not get better. But I am sharing with you my truth because I want you to know that when I get up on this podcast or I'm coaching you and I'm telling you things, it's not because I didn't go through my own stuff. It's not because I didn't work through my own shit or that I'm still not working through my own shit. I'm telling you things that I only could have learned from doing my work and that I am hoping that I can hold space for you to do your own work. Because although I started this episode off by saying a counselor told me to go look these things up, what I didn't tell you is after she told me, the reason why she told me to go look the things up and not that we would be working together on it is because she fired me as a client. There was not a clear reason as to why but she fired me as a client. And I took that to me because she was probably like the second person in a row who fired me. Now, the first person said I had ran out of sessions at the university counseling center, so I couldn't keep seeing her. And I went to this person and I was just like, well, clearly I'm not supposed to be in therapy because everybody keep leaving me is how I felt. And I feel like I only had to, I was forced to figure it out for myself. But I think I would say that that needed to happen. Like I needed to be able to do this work and grapple with some things. Eventually I get back into therapy with someone else who could hold space for me. But at this time I didn't have it. So that's why I'm like, please go to therapy. I am a big is it, proponent of therapy, but I also don't think therapy can be your only tool because I only, I think therapy can only go so far. I'm not trying to shit on y'all profession. I just know in my life, it can, it can only go so far. We got to find other tools. And this was the right around the time that I started finding coaching in the way that I know it now. And together, coaching and therapy and my own research and willingness to do the work made all the difference. But in the next one, I'm going to tell you how me reaching out for help, because I was like distraught, y'all. I was like, I can't believe she sent me these voicemails. Does she not remember that I'm her daughter that she's talking to? So I'm going to tell you how that ends, but I just want you to take a moment and breathe and I will talk to you next week for the next episode.